As over two million American soldiers boarded the transport ships bound for France, more than one million American women sustained the wartime labor force. A great many jobs, which had previously been considered man's work, were being filled by women. In the factory, the shipyard, and the armed forces. Women plowed the fields, fixed the cars, delivered the mail, ran the elevators and the streetcars, and even wrote the traffic tickets. President Wilson encouraged employers to pay female workers the same wages they had paid men, but few did. Even worse, when the war was over and men returned to the workforce, a great many women were fired. Other women contributed to the war effort by volunteering. They served in the Red Cross, sold Liberty Bonds, and planted Victory Gardens. Others, like Jane Addams and Carrie Chapman Catt, raised public awareness by actively demonstrating against war and militarism. As the war dragged on, the nation began to appreciate the valuable contribution made by women in the war effort, creating a prime opportunity for a change in women's civil liberties. On January 10, 1917, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns of the National Women's Party took action. For almost a year, they paraded and picketed the White House, demanding passage of a constitutional amendment granting women suffrage, the right to vote. Wilson was out of office by the time the 19th Amendment was ratified, but there was no doubt that the new role of women in America during World War I was a catalyst leading to the right to vote. Society also had to come to grips with a new role for African Americans. Like most Americans, African Americans were divided in their opinions about the war. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote an editorial in The Crisis, a newspaper published by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, urging African Americans to support the war effort. Let us, while the crisis lasts, forget our special grievances and close our ranks shoulder to shoulder with our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy. William Monroe Trotter, editor of the Boston Guardian newspaper, disagreed. He felt African Americans were victims of racism and should not support a racist government. At home, the war contributed to the large-scale migration of more than half a million African Americans into the industrialized cities of the North. They provided the workforce desperately needed to produce wartime goods. In addition, immigration into America had slowed to a trickle and many immigrants had returned to their native homelands leaving more jobs to be filled. Despite the many women employed, companies were still short of workers. Many African Americans were anxious to leave the South and its pattern of racial discrimination, low pay, and all too often life-threatening conditions. Between 1892 and 1919, approximately 3,000 African Americans were killed by lynching, mainly in the South. When northern manufacturing companies sent recruiting agents with free railroad tickets into the South looking for laborers, hundreds of thousands of men and women boarded trains and headed for cities like Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia. The Chicago Defender, the most widely read African American newspaper in the South, urged southern African Americans to come north. Some even wrote the newspaper for advice. Dear sir, I have a wife and one child and can hardly feed them. I thought to write and ask you for some information concerning how to get a pass for myself and family. Please don't publish this because we have to whisper this around among ourselves because the white folks are angry now because the Negroes are going north. Able-bodied men and women came and found work in places like Henry Ford's assembly lines where they could make as much as five dollars a day far exceeding anything African Americans could earn in the South. Despite the opportunities in the North, black Americans found some new and some familiar problems in the North. Many blacks were forced to live in crowded, segregated housing, contributing to the rise of urban black ghettos, 
and they paid ridiculously high rents for the dubious privilege. African Americans were frequently denied membership in labor unions by white workers. Therefore, they were left few choices other than to accept unpopular positions as scabs or replacement workers employed during strikes. This labor struggle bred resentment among white laborers, their feelings fueled by ignorant racist opinions. Instead of competing with whites, some African Americans became entrepreneurs within the black community itself. They opened stores and insurance agencies, or offered personal services like undertaking and hairdressing. Other African American men and women allowed few options, worked as domestic servants. In the North, a cook or a laundress earned as much money in a day as she made in a week back South. Domestic servants could earn twice as much in a Northern home as a Southern home. But Northern homes tended to be smaller and more modern, so fewer African Americans were being hired for full-time work. Regardless, jobs, even at the lowest factory pay scale, could earn African Americans $3 a day compared to 50 cents a day in the rural South. But soon, the competition and racial tension between white and black workers led to race riots in dozens of northern cities. In July of 1970, white workers, incensed by the hiring of blacks as strike breakers at an East St. Louis, Illinois munitions plant, ran through the streets, mindlessly stalking and killing blacks. 49 African Americans and 9 white Americans died. The New York Age reported on the march. They marched without uttering one word or making a single gesticulation and protested in respectful silence against the reign of mob law, segregation, Jim Crowism, and many other indignities to which race is unnecessarily subjected in the United States. Just two years later, a 17-year-old swam from the Black Beach to the White Beach on the shores of Lake Michigan in Chicago. Whites threw rocks at him until he drowned. Provoked by the whites' barbaric action, blacks revolted. News of the fight reached several neighborhoods, and within hours, fighting broke out there, too. For three days and nights, the riot went unchecked until Illinois state troopers finally restored peace. 38 people lost their lives, 23 African American and 15 white, with another 520 citizens injured. James Weldon Johnson, diplomat, poet, novelist, critic, and composer, said the summer of 1919 was the red summer of hate for the bloodshed in racial violence. White America was learning what black Americans had known all along. Racial prejudice wasn't a problem confined to the South. It was an American problem. And African Americans weren't the only ones whose civil liberties were being abused.